Hello there, I'm Rob George, I'm Associate Professor of Family Law at University College London. I'm going to talk in this lecture about the idea of parental responsibility, uh, which is found in the Children Act, trying to unpick some of the challenges uh, that I think this concept has created, and in particular, trying to make some sense of the definition that we find in the Children Act, um, unravelling some of the nuances about the scope and application of the idea of parental responsibility. And I'm going to say at the outset, this is a bit of a work in progress still. So uh, if you have thoughts and ideas and things I've overlooked or got wrong, you should feel free to be in touch and let me know. So let's kick off by just reminding ourselves about the idea of parental responsibility. This is defined uh, right up front in section 31 of the Children Act. All the rights, duties, powers, responsibilities and authority which by law a parent of a child has in relation to the child and his property. This is pretty much as far as the Children Act goes in telling us what parental responsibility means and uh, Lady Justice Black, in a 2010 case called uh, TNT, described that definition in section 3.1 as being a very clear exposition of the broad concept. But, with the greatest of respect to Lady Justice Black, I don't think it says anything really at all. Uh, what are the rights that the law gives to a parent? What are the duties? That a parent has as a matter of law. None of this is actually clear at all. And worse, as we're going to say in just a moment, in some ways that definition is very clearly wrong. So let's start just by illustrating the ways, or some of the ways at least, in which it's just actually wrong. So the first um, and most clear example of this, I think, is child support. The law imposes an obligation to provide financial support for a child, and this is in fact one of the most fundamental duties that a parent has. Um, but if you have even the most cursory look at the Child Support Act of 1991 and its subsequent legislation, what you'll find is that the primary financial duties that the law imposes are imposed on the person who is a legal parent of the child. That, as you'll know from uh, your general studies of family law, is connected, but not the same as, the question of who has parental responsibility. And in particular, uh, for people who aren't the birth mother of the child, the rules about who has parental responsibility are not the same as who has, uh, who is a legal parent. Meanwhile, the Child Support Act does not, as a general proposition, impose any liability financially towards a child on a person who is not a parent, but who has parental responsibility. So given that, going back to it, the Children Act confidently asserts that PR means all the duties which by law a parent of a child has in relation to the child, that's not true because the child support obligation, one of the most fundamental obligations and duties that a parent owes to their child, isn't part of parental responsibility at all. It's part of legal parenthood. So far from being this very clear exposition of a broad concept, I have to say, in fact, that Section 3.1 gives uh, an unclear and in some ways actively misleading explanation of what is encompassed in the legal status of being a holder of parental responsibility. So there's a first problem with PR. It's also unclear what the outer limits of parental responsibility are in any particular context. This is um, what the court has sometimes referred to as being the ambit or zone of a parent's parental responsibility. That's a phrase that was um, initially used by Mr Justice Hayden, picked up by Lady Black in her judgment in Reed D in 2019. And delineating the edges of the zone of parental responsibility is really very difficult. And there are a number of particular challenges that make it hard to give a precise answer to what is the zone of parental responsibility. 
So one of those challenges to start with is that there are a great many rules about what parents can do that are expressed by reference to effectively normal societal standards. So there's no fixed definition, it's based on what other people do. So one example of that is uh, about the removal of children from the care of their parents um, when the children are suffering or at risk of suffering significant harm. This is the threshold of the care proceedings. Um, and the question is, not only is the child suffering or at risk of suffering significant harm, but under limb B of the section 31 threshold test, the court has to be satisfied that the cause of that harm or risk of harm is that the care being given to the child or likely to be given if the order were not made, is not what it would be reasonable to expect a parent to give. So here you've got um, a provision which specifically tells the court we have to ask about the reasonable parenting. The court has endeavoured to interpret the provision to allow a pretty wide range of parenting practices, but it's still clearly a limitation on what parents can do in the exercise of their parental responsibility and it's not far from the US Supreme Court's definition of obscenity. We know it when we see it. So we know that parents are being, being unreasonable, but how do we know that? And if you had to explain to somebody where the limits were, could you do that? It's an enormously vague standard, but crucial to our understanding of what parental responsibility means and to the acceptable standards of parenting in care proceedings. A second challenge to understanding the limits of parental responsibility comes from the idea of the child's own developing competence. So this um, is usually known in relation to the 1986 um, House of Lords decision of uh, Gillick and West Norfolk and Weisbeck Air Health Authority, and in particular the judgment of Lord Scotland that you see on the screen there. This is, um, in short, the idea that a child uh, with a sufficient maturity and understanding of whatever the particular issue is uh, that's in um, scope for being decided, should be able to make that decision for him or herself. But, as of course you will know if you have already studied this topic, the scope uh, of the idea of Gillick competence and what it means is highly contested. The wording of the Gillick judgments themselves, particularly as I say that of Lord Scarman, seems to suggest a very significant limitation on parents' rights as children get older, mature and understand the issues that are parts of their lives. But the subsequent interpretation of the Gillick decision leads to some fairly difficult to answer questions about what that actually means for parental responsibility. So it's not my focus today to think about that, but Two subsequent decisions of the Gillick, both well known in recent cases, um, in particular raise questions about what the scope of parental responsibility really is. So, the first, which seems to um, expand what Gillick had left behind in our understanding of parental responsibility in RE R, um, Lord Donaldson, again pictured here, um, says that the court uh, will allow a parent still to override. Uh, their child's objections to medical treatment. So as long as the parent gives consent, even if the child, who is Gillick competent, uh, refuses to consent, the doctor is permitted to proceed to provide treatment uh, and will not be at any risk of any uh, adverse legal proceedings against him or her. The second, um, having expanded in some ways the idea of parental responsibility back into the area which appeared to have been taken away by Gillick, um, the VW decision then in some ways goes the other way because the Court of Appeal, again Lord Donaldson uh, giving the main judgment, seems then to say that even if the parents and the child agree, and indeed in this case the child was older than 16 and so appeared even by statute to have the right to make the decision about medical treatment, the court, Lord Donaldson says, can still override both of them. So even if the parents and the child, Gillick competent or over 16, object to the treatment and refuse to give consent, the court can intervene and override both of them. <laughs> 
So where does that leave us in relation to parental responsibility? Well, as I say, my focus today isn't really on the idea of guilt in this line of cases, but anyone who is interested in that could commend uh, Professor Stephen Gilmore's writing on this subject in his 2009 uh, chapter, Limits of Parental Responsibility, uh, in uh, the book that he co-edited with Rebecca Probert and Jonathan Herring. Um, uh, Stephen really explores that idea in some depth about what, what this means and how far it goes, and in some of his later writing has also looked at similar issues. But it's not my focus today. I want to focus on a couple of other points um, to try to unpick a bit more about some of the other challenges that we see in relation to parental responsibility. And the next stage uh, of doing that is to turn away from parents and think about local authorities. A local authority can uh, gain parental responsibility for a child in two connected ways. One is where the child is the subject of a full care order under section 31. The other is where the child is subject to an interim care order under section 38. The thresholds and tests for those two orders are slightly different, although they're both connected to a child who is suffering or is at risk of suffering significant harm. But the outcome from the local authority's perspective is largely the same. Uh, the local authority in particular gains parental responsibility. And the crucial thing to note here is that subject to what I'm about to go on to say, parental responsibility is the same. It's defined in the same way. There is only one definition, and it's that definition in section 3.1 that we looked at at the beginning. All the rights, duties, powers, responsibilities, and authority that a parent has as a matter of law in relation to the child. So when a local authority gets parental responsibility under one of these sections, it's the same parental responsibility as the parents have, subject to what I'm about to say. So that there's two um, differences when a local authority has parental responsibility. The first is that there are some specific limitations on what the local authority is allowed to do with that parental responsibility. So in section 33, subsection 6, there are specific limitations on the local authority itself. So they're not allowed issues to uh, change the child's religious upbringing. They're not allowed to make or refuse to make an adoption order. And they're not allowed to appoint a guardian, which is to say somebody to take over the care of the child in legal terms if both of the parents were to die. So those things are specific limitations which a parent in the exercise of their parental responsibility would be free to do, but the local authority is not. In subsection 7, there are also restrictions on anyone um, exercising parental responsibility in a particular way, taking actions that relate to parental responsibility, where care order is in force. But these apply to everybody, not just the local authority. And if you have a look back um, for comparison, under section 13 of the Children Act, there are very uh, similar equivalent provisions that apply as between parents when a residence order is used to be called a child arrangements order where a child is to live with a person is in force. So actually, these restrictions under subsection 7, although applicable here because of the care order, are really just a reflection of restrictions that apply in almost all cases where, where a child arrangements order is in force as well. So we've got some specific limitations on what the PR of a local authority can be used for. But on the other hand, uh, the local authority's parental responsibility is in fact, in some ways, greater than a parent's parental responsibility. Because if you look back to subsection three of section 33, this is the provision that gives the local authority PR in the first place. So subsection A gives the local authority parental responsibility. Subsection B, gives the local authority then power to determine the extent to which the parent may meet his or her own parental responsibility. So a parent retains parental responsibility when the care order is made. It doesn't stop the parent having the PR, it gives it to the local authority as well. But ultimately, at the end of the process, if there is a dispute between the local authority and the parents about how parental responsibility should be exercised, section 33 Subsection 3, um, paragraph B, basically says the local authority makes the decisions. So the, the PR that the local authority gets 
although limited in those ways that we saw in uh, subsection 6, in general terms is actually more potent than the power of the parent because the local authority's PR can trump the parent's decisions. And that built-in um, hierarchy of parental responsibility explains the, the, the existence of section 9 subsection 1 in the uh, Children Act, where when the local authority has uh, the child in its care, the court is not permitted to make uh, section 8 orders, private law orders, and in particular not to make private law orders for specific issue orders or prohibited steps orders. So those two orders, which ordinarily would be the way the court resolved a dispute about an issue of parental responsibility, the court's forbidden to make those orders where a uh, care order is in force. And the straightforward explanation for why is that Parliament has already decided if there's a dispute between the parents and the local authority when the child is in care, the local authority gets to make that decision. So the court isn't allowed to be brought into play by the parents to try to challenge the local authority's decision making. And the local authority doesn't need a, a section eight order, a specific issue or prohibited steps order, because they already have this um, trumping parental responsibility. Or so it seems. But in fact, it gets more complicated because the courts have uh, explained that Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights has to be taken into account when thinking about all of these issues. And so that provision, which provides, of course, for the right to respect the private and family life, home and correspondence, um, and that the state may not interfere with that right to respect for those things without proportionate justification. Um, that has application, obviously, to all of family law, but the, but the court has said it has application even when the local authority already has parental responsibility and care for them. So let's take a couple of examples. The first is a child who is in local authority care for whatever reason, but not because of an issue about failure to provide medical treatment, but where the child subsequently develops a need for a particular medical treatment. The parents, for whatever reason, are opposed to that medical treatment and assume that the child is either not gillic competent or that the child also is opposed to the medical treatment. The starting point, thinking about how that should be resolved to child in care who needs medical operation, would be to say, well, the the local authority has parental responsibility. Medical treatment is definitely within the zone of parental responsibility. Uh, and we know that because clearly parents can consent to medical treatment and do so every day uh, for minor and major medical procedures. So since the local authority has this trumping parental responsibility, the answer would seem to be the local authority can give the relevant consent to the medical treatment and the parents um, don't really get to stop them. But the courts have cast serious doubt on that. So in a judgment in the family court, but given by the president of the family division, Sir James Mumby, um, and therefore obviously carrying a, a degree of, uh, of senior authority, um, the president said, um, in what I think it's also right to say, obiter comments, that a local authority would be ill-advised to rely on its parental responsibility under Section 33 of the Children Act um, to authorise medical treatment when parents are opposed to it. And the reason, he says, is because of the parents and the child's Article 8 rights. Uh, and so he says instead that rather than simply proceeding, the local authority should seek a court order to avoid risk of any breach of Article 8. So that's one example. And another uh, where a similar issue arises um, is where a local authority who gets a care order is not required to remove a child from the family uh, home. It simply is empowered to do so and must then make a decision whether to do so or not. And it will be part of the uh, local authority's care plan that is put before the court as to whether they intend to do that or not. The question is, supposing 
the original plan was to leave the children in the family home with the parents or one of the parents. The care order is made on that basis, but subsequent actions or inactions by the parents mean the local authority think it is actually necessary to remove the child to foster care or to live elsewhere. Can the local authority use their parental responsibility to treat the parent's decision about where that child should live? The answer on the face of it, again, would seem to be yes. But the court, um, this time in the decision of Mr Justice Baker in the case called RE-DE, has said, again, because of Article 8 uh, rights to respect the private and family life of the parents and of the children, that the local authority cannot simply um, take that action without giving proper warning to the family and giving them time uh, to make an application to oppose that. And that if the local authority simply removes them, except in an absolute emergency, that is going to be a, a violation of Article 8 rights. So the difficulty here, seems to me, is going to be uh, for the local authority having parental responsibility um, to know when it can use that parental responsibility and when it can't. And so coming back to the idea of parental responsibility as this very clear exposition of a broad concept, uh, actually, despite what Lady Justice Black says in TNT, I don't think it's very clear and straightforward at all. And we can further see that, um, turning to some more recent decisions in a moment, by uh, thinking about the idea of whether there are uh, or is a category of decisions within the zone of parental responsibility, which are so significant in some way that parents are required to consult about them. Now, the courts have clearly said since the early 2000s that there is such a category, even when the uh, children specifically says that any holder of parental responsibility may act alone and without the other people involved in meeting their parental responsibility. The court's been clear for a long time that there is this duty to consult about significant issues. And uh, John Ricola, who's pictured there, wrote about this back in 1998. And if you're interested, um, that article is definitely still uh, worth reading. But what are significant decisions? There is no answer to that question. And we can illustrate that in, with, in particular by thinking about the idea of vaccinations. So the court has long said that vaccination of children falls within this category of significant decisions. So we see in 2003 as an example of that. So if the parents don't agree about whether a child should be uh, immunised or receive vaccinations, the answer is that they must get a court order to determine that issue. Um, but in the summer of 2020, the Court of Appeal heard a, a case called REACH, Parental Responsibility Vaccination. And I'm going to talk about one aspect of that today, but I just wanted to highlight, I've written about a couple of other different aspects of it in an article that's just coming out uh, October 2020 in the Law Quarterly Review called Parental Responsibility Vaccinations and the Role of the Court, where I take uh, issue with some of the analysis of Lady Justice King, uh, who gives the main judgment in that case, um, to the, to the court's powers and what the court can do. I think um, she takes a very limited view of what the court's role is, and, and I take issue with her analysis of that and her conclusions. So if you're interested in looking at the edge further, there's, a bit more, there's more to say than we're going to say in this lecture. Um, but focusing on today's issues, um, let me just tell you briefly about that. Uh, this is a case, obviously, about the vaccination of, of a child, but it, unlike in REC, which was a private law dispute between the parents, in REH, it's a child who is in local authority care and care order, um, but the parents are opposed to the child receiving just the standard immunizations that all children receive. The local authority wanted the children, the child, to have that, those vaccinations. Um, Following the president's decision in RE-AB, at the moment, the local authority took the view that they would be, as he had said, ill-advised to rely on their own parental responsibility, uh, and so they made an application to the court. Uh, the 
High Court and uh, Court of Appeal both held that the warning that the President had given about Article 8 and the breach of Article 8 if the local authority proceeded using its own privilege of responsibility did not apply to the issue of vaccination because, they said, it was not a sufficiently significant decision to invoke Article 8. So contrary to the earlier authority we see, uh, which had required parents in private disputes to go to the court, Lady Justice King um, considered that the issue was so straightforward uh, and that there were no realistic arguments that could be put against vaccination uh, in a case where doctors recommended vaccination, i.e. where the child didn't have a particular medical condition that was um, uh, opposed to vaccinations. Um, but uh, Lady Justice King is able to say, this isn't going to be challengeable in the court, and so the local authority is free to proceed. Uh, and if the, if the parents try to challenge the local authority's decision, uh, they won't uh, have good prospects, and indeed the court would not really even entertain that uh, challenge. So there's a number of, uh, of difficulties here, um, and REH really uh, throws some, some, some interesting challenges about parental responsibility and this duty to consult. So first of all, it goes to show that this category of so-called significant decisions that the court has cre created completely for itself um, has no um, principled content. It's just an arbitrary list of things at the time the court happens to think are important. Uh, and Lady Justice King is very clear that if this case really which had been about a private law dispute, she would have said that RE-C was no longer right. So vaccination or immunisation, um, very, very clearly said to be a significant decision in 2003, but just um, 17 years later, the Court of Appeal saying, no, it's so obviously not controversial that, of course, it should be uh, allowed. Uh, and there's no need to, to bring a court case about that. Um, and the second challenge that REH really throws up is the, the distinction between the REAB judgment of the president and what Lady Justice King says in REH. So why, if the local authority relies on its parental responsibility to authorise a medical operation that a doctor says is in the child's uh, medically best interests, is there a breach of Article 8? But a local authority authorising vaccinations that a doctor says are in the child's best interests, but the parents oppose, is not breaching its correct. Where's the difference between those two things? Oh, and how do we know it? Lady Justice King tries to answer that question in her judgment in re -H. So she says, um, referring back to the president's decision, it's unclear whether in making his observations, the president meant to include all medical treatment of whatever nature, or only of the type which he uh, was concerned with in that case, namely, a desperately ill child. She says, in the unlikely event that Sir James's view uh, was that the, child, the local authority couldn't use its powers in relation to any medical treatment, then with the greatest of respect, I would disagree. So she tries to explain that she thinks the president's comments are just too broad. He makes a sweeping comment about all kinds of medical treatment of any kind. And Lady Justice King says, no, it can't be as broad as that. But what she doesn't do is answer the question, where then is the line? How do we know? At least with the president's approach, we know any medical treatment of any kind, you can't rely on your parental responsibility if you're a local authority, you need a court order. But Lady Justice King has completely thrown open the question of, of where the line is, because then there are a great many things between vaccinations to children with no reason to have vaccinations from a medical perspective, on the one hand, and the counter uh, proposition that she puts forward in that quotation there, a desperately ill child. Um, I mean, if anything, one might make an argument that the case where a child is desperately ill and therefore in urgent need of medical treatment, the local authority should be more entitled to rely on its parental responsibility in the context of parents who have already had a child removed from their care because the child is suffering or at risk of suffering significant harm attributable to the care being provided by those parents. Um, then in the case of vaccinations where it's sort of, it's not really urgent, it's not absolutely essential to have vaccinations overall children to have them, 
but some children don't. So in one sense, you're saying that the more serious the issue is, the more the local authority ought to be the one making the decisions. Um, but the real question is, given what Lady Justice King has said here, and the fact that she's removed the bright line rule that the president appeared to be setting down in VFB, what are we supposed to take away from that as to the line? Where is the line of what a local authority can do with its parental responsibility? And how is it to know what limitations Article 8 puts on uh, the exercise of its parental responsibility? So I'm going to just wrap this up there. Uh, and this is a lecture that I think has probably raised a lot more questions than it has offered answers. Um, and, and I guess to some extent, I apologise for that. But the issues that I've raised here um, are meant to show that the substantive content of parental responsibility and the limitations of what a whole of parental responsibility can do um, are really very unclear. Um, and so for a provision which is stated so straightforwardly in the Children Act, which the courts have never felt any need to try to really define or, or, or explain in great detail. There's actually rather a lot to say and a lot that isn't clear. So I hope that has given you some things to think about in relation to parental responsibility. Um, but I think it, I hope it's also given you uh, some insight into the fact of the way that even some fairly fundamental concepts that underpin all of child law and, and beyond that into all of family law, I would say, can start to unravel if you peel away the surface. So thank you very much for your time and for listening to the lecture. I hope you found it interesting. We'll see you again. Thanks.